Good morning. Well, many years ago, an extremely poor and at that time unknown artist lived in Kansas City. Kansas City doesn't just produce great football teams. Big game yesterday for the Kansas City fans, but this unknown artist for a while took a variety of jobs, one of which eventually led him to become a mechanic in an auto garage. He didn't know a whole lot about vehicles, but he needed to make some money and he needed to work on his craft. And so he took a job and was able to also, well, to not only work at the garage, but to live at the garage. And so as the garage would close uh, at night, uh, he would, because he couldn't afford, again, another place to live, he would slip back to his bedroom, and it would just be a few hours later after cleaning all the grease off of him from the day's work that he would begin to draw. And he would often spend the entire night, night after night, drawing. One particular night, he's drawing, and he hears a noise, looks down to the ground and sees a little mouse running by his feet. And so he doesn't think a whole lot of it, but night after night, the mouse would run by his feet, and eventually he decided that he would befriend the mouse, and so he took some crumbs off of his plate, and he put the crumbs next to his feet, and sure enough, that little mouse ran up and grabbed the crumbs, and thus began a friendship with an artist, a starving artist, and a mouse, no longer starving, And little did this artist know that it would only be a matter of time before this mouse would change his life. You see, it would be just a few years later when the animated version of this mouse, whom this artist later named Mickey, would become a household name. As a matter of fact, this artist would, well, put into production a mouse that would come the, at the time, listen to this, the most popular actor in Hollywood, receiving more fan mail than any other actor had ever received in Hollywood. And this mouse would be on more theater screens than any other character or artist had ever, or actor had ever been before. The artist obviously is Walt Disney, and the mouse was Mickey Mouse. To date... Since 1937, by the way, the Walt Disney Company has produced 903 feature films, 786 short films, and 118 TV movies, and presently has more than 64 movies and TV shows in production. The Walt Disney Company, this blows my mind, nets, doesn't gross, but nets about $60 million a day. Wrap your head around that. $60 million dollars today. Mr. Disney has become a true Hollywood story and in many ways a non-conformist story. He proved the film industry wrong. He became this pioneer and he charted his own course. Basically every movie house in Hollywood initially turned down Mr. Disney and eventually they all wanted Mr. Disney. But he chose to do his own thing and chart his own course and in the process he made a tiny mouse, an extremely popular mouse and he's made a whole lot of money. And Well, he has rewritten the books as it relates to one charting their own course and non-conforming to the way, well, in this story of the way of Hollywood. Listen to this. The world says that rules kind of squelch my freedom and directions limit my ability and guidelines are narrow-minded and being, well, a person of one set mind is often a legalistic and a biased person. Some might agree with this. Some might agree that, well, there's something to be said for the thrill of your own adventure. Some would consider themselves to be conformist. Others would consider themselves to be nonconformist. But whoever you might consider yourself to be, we're going to talk a little bit about nonconformity today because it has everything to do with orthodoxy. You see, the pursuit of orthodoxy creates this immediate tension between a Christian and an ever-shifting world. And whether you would say your life pursuit is one of conforming or non-conforming. I want you to see this. Put this on the screen this morning, Brennan. Look at this right here this morning. You can write or you can just take it in, but it's a great start for us. Whether your life pursuit is one you would define as conformist or non-conformist, embracing orthodoxy doesn't require you to forfeit any adventure at all. I'm not so sure that Mr. Disney would have called himself a non-conformist. I don't know. I never had a conversation, obviously, 
with him. But as conformity relates to orthodoxy, whether you would define your life as one that follows the rules or breaks the rules, orthodoxy we're going to see today really is about adventure. It's about not forfeiting adventure. And to society, particularly a society that says never conform, Guys, I believe this to be true. One of the most, listen, one of the most rebellious things you and I can do in a world that celebrates nonconformity is to stand out from the crowd and to love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Amen? Walt Disney was a true nonconformist, I believe. And so too was Jesus. And in charting his own course, Jesus outlined with his very life the foundational truths that define the Christian faith. That's orthodoxy. We're going to talk about this today. I'm Jeffrey. I'm glad you're here. we got a lot to unpack. Stand up, say good morning to someone, share a little Donald's on first love. We're going to have a big morning for us. Glad you're here. Thank you for joining us here at Donaldson First. For those of you online, we're glad you're with us today. This is week three of a big series for us entitled Orthodoxy. And I truly am, as I am every week, but I especially am excited with where we are headed in Scripture today. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? You just take a moment and just settle, just settle your hearts and just allow the Lord just to position your attention to his. We also want to think of uh, the Folsoms this morning. Chris Folsom and his family have been in Florida as Chris, his wife Kristen, her, her father passed away last week. And I know it's been a difficult week for them. We pray for them as they're traveling back to Nashville today. I just wonder if there's something heavy as well on your heart this morning. If so, if you would just take the moment and lay that at the feet of Jesus. And you would just ask him to be your everything. You would align your heart with his. Father, that is our prayer this morning, that our heart would be aligned with the very heart of God. And we would not miss what you have for us. Lord, I believe sometimes if, if we're not careful, church can just be another moment on the calendar from week to week. And I pray that not be the case for us. That we would recognize the privilege that we have in this very moment to meet with our Creator, the living God, and to do so corporately in a nation giving us freedom to do so. May we never take that for granted. As we look today at the truths of your word, the, the orthodoxy, foundational principles that define our walk in you, may you lead us and for your glory. We ask this in your name. All God's people said. Grab a seat. Orthodoxy, we have defined this several times as the foundational truth. The foundational truths that define our walk. Our walk with the Lord, the faith that we hold to as Christians. Next week will be a really big week for us. I hope you're marking it. If you can't be here, I hope you'll make plans to check out the archive as all of our messages are archived at donaldsonfirst.com. But next week, we're going to begin to walk through the very specific foundational truths that define our faith point by point, the true orthodoxy of Scripture. We're going to begin at the beginning of Scripture and make our way through Scripture, and I believe it's going to be a fascinating journey for us. But before we get to next week, I think it's an important, I don't think, I know, this is an important detailed week of exploration for us because I believe it is really important for us to define some parameters. I, I believed getting to my office this past Monday that beginning here week three of this series that we were going to jump into these foundational truths and we were going to begin to walk point by point through these truths. But as I began to, to study through these, I found myself asking some questions and going to scripture for answers and spending more time probably last week on my knees in my office than I had spent in a while. And I realized for, from my walk with the Lord that I, I needed first to establish some, some parameters to help me best digest these truths. And so if you'll allow me, much of this today is for me. I hope you will grab as much as needed for you as well. But I believe in doing so that this 
This journey this, this morning is going to help us best apply what we're going to hear in future mornings through, through this series. Since the beginning of this series, I, w- I will tell you this, I have heard from, from many of you, I've had numerous conversations uh, in, in my office uh, via text, phone calls as I have been asked just a lot of questions about orthodoxy and really have been asked a lot of questions about how, how do we... Think about this. I wonder if this has been a consideration for you. How do we reconcile these truths knowing that there's a right in Scripture and a very clear wrong in Scripture? But how do we reconcile this when we find ourselves in relationships and conversations with people who believe completely different than us? And how do we have engaging conversations without losing a sense of of trustworthiness from these people? We, we, we know this, we, we live in this, this world that says there isn't just one way, that we, that we should not conform. Now, the Bible tells us not to conform to the standard of the world, but we are to align ourselves with the standard of truth in God's Word, amen? But as we come up against those who see such differently, it can be so easy and can happen so quickly that when we take a stand for right and wrong, if If we're not careful, the conversation can get out of control quickly and the relationship and the process can be lost. Well, I wish that I could give you a a quick answer here in Scripture to subside what could be a firestorm sometimes in our conversations. This is a difficult place for us to begin, but I want to take you to Luke chapter 12. And I want to quickly, a lot of Scripture today, I want to quickly show you a passage that might not make you feel better if you find yourself questioning such that I've just explained But hopefully it will help you understand that there are, listen, there are times, reality, it's just simple. It's hard to stand for truth and not be divisive. It's just hard. And I've I've struggled with this this week. And I want to take you to a passage as we begin where Jesus himself is speaking. And he offers tremendous wisdom as he always does. But in many ways really fuels the fire As a matter of fact, the title of this passage in my Bible says, Not peace, but division. This is Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Our Savior speaks, Have I come to bring fire on the earth? (laughs) How I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism first to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Speaking of, obviously, he is going to the cross. Look what he says in verse 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. We really could park right here and spend the entirety of our time talking on this one verse right here. Reminding us of the difficulty and the challenges of standing as Christ followers in a world that will look to us as very divisive people. No, I tell you, but division. From now on, look at verse 52. Speaking of the challenges, even among our family members, from now on there will be five in the family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. It doesn't say here mother-in-law against son-in-law because every mother-in-law and son-in-law have just a fantastic relationship. I know I do. I tell you, I know I do. I want to make, I want to make that statement from here. I know I do. The division is quite strong that Jesus is explaining here. This is really hard for us to digest. I mean, li- li- again, living for truth is very divisive. You might want to write that down this morning just as a reminder to you. I'm not going to necessarily put this on the screen. But the journey of discovering truth and then aligning our lives as Christ followers to orthodoxy of Scripture is really, really hard. And, and, and listen, when you, when you align your life with orthodoxy, listen, this is the reality. You will alienate your life from others. You will alienate your life from others, particularly those not aligned with the same principles. The pursuit of orthodoxy we're going to see today is super challenging. And there's just, there's just no way around it. And it forces you it forces me to examine my life and to, to check my choices and my passions and my struggles and my goals and my leadership style and my relationships with my wife and my daughters and each of you as my, my church family. Orthodoxy forces all of us to pause and to consider how we communicate to and how we love on those who choose to 
align their lives with Christianity and those who choose not so. And so there's, there's a lot for us to unpack. So I think it's important, and I hope you're, you're catching this, that before we get to these foundational truths, again, we need to establish some parameters to, to lead us in this. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I want to give you two questions this morning. And the first question is this, why is orthodoxy necessary? And question number two is this, what will orthodoxy cost me? Think about these two questions. Why is orthodoxy necessary? And what will orthodoxy cost me? I'm, I want to work to answer both of these questions through several thoughts that I want to give you today. I hope to get to all six. The first is this, as I answer these two questions, let me give you a couple of thoughts. Thought number one, I truly believe this is a great starting point for us. And it, it seems rather elementary for me to say this and it might seem silly for me to remind you of this, but it's a great starting, po starting point. Number one, orthodoxy, I hope you would agree with this, is worth the pursuit. Truth is worth the pursuit. These foundational principles are worth the pursuit. Let me give you an example. One foundational truth that defines the Christian faith, and we're going to look at this. Probably we're going to unpack this next week. But one, one, one truth, one orthodoxy that, that defines the Christian faith is the statement that we see in Scripture that while on earth Jesus was both fully man and fully God. If you agree with this orthodoxy, say, I agree. The scripture says this, that Jesus was both fully man and fully God while he lived on planet earth. As a matter of fact, there are more than 103 passages that give credit to this truth. That while on earth, Jesus, yes, was fully God, but he was also fully man. Now, our human nature can have difficulty digesting this because we're humans. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around the idea that a God could come to earth... And that that God could remain God, but also become fully a human. It's, it's quite perplexing. It's, it's divine in, in nature. It is truth. But it's, it's difficult to imagine that, well, that Jesus Christ could be fully God, could come to earth and could maintain his lordship, but could also be fully man. We're not the only ones to have struggled with this. In the year... A.D. 357, the church was in this furious debate. It's quite the read if you just wanted to, if just wanted to Google this. You would be amazed at the conversations that came from what was known as the Council of Sirmium. It was, again, 357 A.D. Church leaders came together to debate whether, in fact, Jesus, while on planet Earth, was just a God, was just a man, or was both. And the read, again, is, is quite fascinating. And in an attempt to find unity, which can be difficult to do, as you know, even in the church, the leaders came together in a Roman province known as Pannonia, located on the Sava River. I have never heard of the Sava River. It's now modern-day Serbia. Here's their conclusion. After several days of meeting together at this initial Council, look at the screen. The screen. Their conclusion was this: the nature of Christ is glorious beyond words. So we choose to refrain from declaring the details of the identity of Jesus Christ. This was their summary statement from this time that they were together. At first glance, it, it sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, the nature of Christ is glorious. We believe Christ's nature to be glorious, but it's the second part, the summary statement here. Part B of their, of their statement, because his nature is glorious, look at what they say. This is quite interesting. We choose to refrain from declaring the details of the identity of Jesus Christ. I find this troubling. I hope you too find this troubling. Essentially, these church leaders said, hey, we can't agree to agree on this. And because we're not quite sure how to bring peace to this in, in our membranes, we're just going to say that we just don't quite know. Well, the danger with this, look at the screen, when I say I don't know, rather than I choose to have faith in God's truths, I open the door to heresy. When I say, well, I'm not quite sure, so I'm just going to say well, it could be one way or it could be the other. Even though Scripture clearly 103 plus passages tells us the truth, the answer to this, 
When we, because we just can't put facts together or it doesn't make sense to us as humans, particularly in the church, say, I'm just not sure, so I'm not going to be sure, and we leave a question mark in culture, I happen to believe that the door becomes open to heresy. I believe Paul understood this as well, that we would potentially have struggles with believing what the Bible says is true. So he writes this ever popular passage, many of which probably people here in this room have memorized. Chapter 11, verse 1 of the book of Hebrews, he says, faith, everyone say faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It is confidence, meaning we can be assured of it. We can nail it down. We can absolutely put our our hope in this, our assurance. We can walk away with an exclamation point. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Actually, Paul continues for 39 more verses. We're not going to walk through them today. For 39 more verses talking about exactly this. He walks back through the Old Testament heroes of the Bible. And he speaks of story after story, though challenging and supernatural circumstances. And in every story, he says, it is by faith we believe these stories. And so when this council gathers and they put a question mark to the end, because they're just not quite sure and say, I don't know. Hey, look at the screen. The journey of discovery requires faith. It does. Our journey, it requires faith. Look at this next sentence on the screen. When I ignore, when I do not accept, or when I become satisfied with the truth of Scripture, I embrace heresy. It's either one way or the other. We open the door to falsity, to false teachings, when we choose not to take God at His word. This counsel chose to allow human reasoning into the equation rather than the discovery of truth and putting faith in the hope of, of God's holy word. And God says, I've thought about this this week, and that's why we're walking through what we're walking through. I'm sure you would agree. Sadly, the posture of many in the church today mirror the findings of this council. Some people believe that in order to maintain unity, that we should just agree to disagree, or even worse, just simply remain silent on the matter of truth, and we cannot. Scripture doesn't give us the freedom to remain silent. Sometimes it feels easier, and for the sake of relationships, it might be easier in the moment. But I don't see where, where, where Jesus gives us on a pass. Rather, Jesus offers us a pass for remaining silent when the debate of truth is on the line. I mean, to think about it, did Jesus come to remain silent? Of course he did not. He says, listen, I've come to bring a fire on earth. And I wish it were so now, he says. Did I, listen again, do you think I've come to bring peace? No, I have come to bring division. This is a difficult part of Scripture for us. We often don't go here. I haven't heard a whole lot of people teach on this particular passage because it's not a feel-good passage. Because it basically says we got to get on one side or the other. And the result will be that division will flow. And that people will not be united with us. This is not a fun posture. But as a Christian, I should never stop pursuing orthodoxy. I should never stop pursuing truth. Again, Paul understood this, and that's why he reminded us in Hebrews, faith's got to be in the mix. Because there's going to be times when conversations are going to be at odds. Relationships are going to divide. But we are never, ever given a pass. Yes, the Bible is complex, but we're never given a pass to just simply be as this council was and say, because we don't know, we choose to set aside faith and just place a question mark. Scripture is very clear as we're going to continue to examine this personally, selfishly. I'll tell you this, and I've struggled with this this week. There are places in Scripture I wish God would have given us more. I'm sure you would agree. There are some answers I don't have that I wish he'd have clearly offered. But I also know that time and time again, that even when we don't get the answer, faith is in the mix. And we trust that he gave us what he wanted us to have in the moment. And faith has to be in the mix. These early Christians just kind of gave up on their pursuit of truth, and we cannot. Because Scripture, look at the screen, Scripture scripture never grants me permission to stop the pursuit of truth. It just doesn't. Let me give you another thought. Orthodoxy, this is really important. Number two, orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is not my truth. 
Now, I'll tell you this. We're not going to have a breather this morning with my really cheesy, terrible jokes. So don't think I'm about to give you one because I'm not. I promise I'm not. I thought this would be a great place for one because this is heavy, heavy stuff today. And so I put, I put six jokes on my page and I showed it to someone and that someone said, hey, you don't need those jokes today. And it kind of waters down where you're headed here. So no joking today. I, w- I really wish I had a funny one right now to give you. Okay, we know my jokes aren't funny, but I wish I had a joke to give you right now. This is another hard one. Number, number two is, is a really difficult one. That orthodoxy is not my truth. I made this statement two weeks ago that as a Christ follower, that I'm to be a truth seeker and a truth protector. I did not make the statement that I am to be a truth creator. I think that's really important for us. We're to seek it. We are to protect it. But listen, we don't define truth. I mean, there's a popular saying in culture right now, speak your truth or, or find your truth. It's very popular in in our culture today, this idea, this expression of finding a truth that is a unique perspective or life journey for you and then go after it with with all that you have. When you you think about many of the the popular movies on, on the big screen these days, many of them involve a person who charts his or her own course, is unorthodox, and finds his or her own way. And we celebrate when that person wins on the big screen. But we see scripturally speaking that when it comes to orthodoxy, truth is not my choice. It is not my way to define. It is defined for us from scripture. And we are called to align our lives to it. And that is completely contrary and completely divisive today. One of the questions that I really hope that we answer today is this second question I gave you earlier. What will orthodoxy cost me? Well, I can tell you this. Orthodoxy will cost me my truth. It will cost me my own truth, my definition of what I believe the world tells me I should be. It will cost me me. It will require me to die to me. It will require me to die to my wants and my desires and my passions and my goals, and my dreams. Now, it doesn't mean that God won't align mine with his, or that God won't change my passions, and my desires, and my goals. Of course he will. If my life is aligned with him, then God will lead me. And I really believe when we see in Scripture where God says he will give us the desires of our hearts, I truly believe that what happens when we align our heart with his, that our desires become his. That he changes our desires. And so when orthodoxy becomes a part of our lives, it's, it's, it's truly em- empowering, but many people try and write their own boundaries. Now look at the screen. Here's the problem with writing your own boundary. When I try and rewrite the boundaries, eventually, this is so important, eventually the boundaries I draw no longer satisfy, and I continue pushing the boundaries further and further and further away from the truth. This is what happens. We establish our boundaries, and for a while they satisfy, and then they no longer satisfy. And so we push the boundaries even further. You know this to be true. Boundaries exist to protect me, not to constrict me. Particularly when we're talking about the scriptural boundaries. And as a Christian, my journey is not about defining truth. My journey is to discover truth. We don't define truth. We've talked about this in week one of this series. We do not define truth. We discover truth. That sentence needs a period at the end of it. That's the truth. But we do not define truth. We discover truth. Truth has already been defined. Everybody say that's right. Truth has already been defined. Truth is timeless. It doesn't change regardless of circumstances or situations. Truth isn't up for debate. And guys, we're going to see this as we make our way in the next couple of weeks through through this, this examination of a multitude. Let me tell you, there are a multitude, a multitude of orthodox statements, including, here's a few of them just to kind of whet your appetite. And get your curiosity going before you head off to Cinco this morning. Orthodoxy. Here's some of the stuff we're going to cover in the next couple of weeks. Orthodoxy truths like the creation of the world. Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. We talked about that briefly moments ago. The virgin birth, the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. The workings of the Holy Spirit. I'm super jazzed about that one. That's going to be a great conversation for us. The forgiveness of sins and life eternal for the Christ follower. The truth that there is a right. And a wrong that I am to follow. And more and more. There is so much that we are going to unpack. And the boundaries today really helping us establish 
How we navigate all of this is so important for us, particularly number three. Look at the screen. The truth boundaries help to better reveal heresy. That's what truth does for us. Truth helps us see lies. It helps us see falsities. If you've seen a movie or a picture highlighting, depicting the life of Julius Caesar, you probably have seen a man who upon his head had rested a laurel wreath. If you've studied Julius Caesar before, you know, he reigned as the emperor of Rome for only only two short years, from 46 to 44 B.C. It's believed that during this time that he wore this this laurel wreath on his set on his head and and many if you were to to examine roman history you would see that often when a person would have such a wreath on particularly his head it would be a sign of victory or a sign of of power oftentimes when winning a battle uh, the leader uh, fighting in such a battle would be given a wreath and a variety of colors would adorn that wreath, but interestingly, this is not why Caesar wore the wreath on his head. He actually wore the wreath, wreath on his head because he was balding. And he did not, no comments about the back of my head. I know it's there. I know it's there. My daughters remind me all the time. I know it's there. Once he took reign as emperor, few people ever saw him again in public not wearing this wreath. What I find ironic is Interestingly, the name Caesar is Latin for a beautiful head of hair. Did you know this? <laughs> the story goes that he was so bothered by the lack of hair on his head that during his time in his affair with Cleopatra, she recommended that she, well, rather that he use the patent. I didn't know they had patents back then. It probably wasn't a patent. They just say it was a patent. But she concocted this mixture to help with those who were balding. It included burned mice and beer grease and horse's teeth and deer poop, and you're supposed to rub it on your head twice a day. Obviously, it was not very effective. Caesar never got his hair back once it began to go. And eventually, the laurel wreath served to hold in place his fake hair. It's a really interesting story. I read the story this week, and it was really interesting to see just how far the emperor would go in disguising the truth was simply, of all things, using a wreath upon his head. And I thought about this. You know, there are so many laurel wreaths in culture today positioned perfectly to disguise lies as truth. To deceive us. To get us to believe that what we see is not, in fact, actually true as it relates to moral and ethical and spiritual and biblical boundaries. The truth has this way of helping us see these boundaries and recognize heresy for what it is. And helping us see truth. Culture encourages us to resist the boundaries, particularly those in the Bible. You know this. The world says resist or, or fight. Or though it was quite the innocent story in the story of Walt Disney to set one's own course, push the boundaries, find your own freedom, chart your own path. There are many, many passages in Scripture that speak otherwise as it relates to our, our spiritual journeys. There's a time when Jesus is with his disciples. He's at the Mount of Olives, and he warns this. This is Matthew chapter 24. Watch out that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. The same happened in in the church during the, the time of Paul in Galatia, Paul wrote this to the church. I'm astonished, he says, astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. This isn't, it isn't new for us today. A gospel which is really no gospel at all, he says. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion. They're trying to convert the gospel of Christ. But look what he says. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. He means this so much, he says it again. As we have already said, so now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Scriptures continue in this this theme of being careful of the heresy, of the lies of our world. Titus 1, there are many rebellious people 
full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those under the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households. Many of the churches in this time were meeting in households, so it's the church households, by teaching things they ought not, and for that sake of dishonest gain. Hebrews 13 says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Listen to Paul again in Romans 16. I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out, he says, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings, the orthodox, the teachings you have learned. He says, keep away from them. Guys, this is why we spend so much time in Scripture. This is why we are so ingrained in the Scripture here at Donaldson First, because we're more in the Word, the more the Word gets into us. Am I right? The more we're in the Word, the more the Word gets into us, the more able we are to see heresy for what it is. Look at the screen here. Staying within the boundaries of orthodoxy is truly what frees me. You should circle this if you're writing this today. That if I stay within the boundaries of orthodoxy, I am free. Once I discover truth, I'm then able to confront lies, to see the falsities of our world, to see falsehood for what it is, the heresy of orthodoxy. Let me give you a couple more thoughts. Truth is attractive. I'm only going to say a few things about this one. Just a few thoughts about this. And I want you to think about the idea of truth being attractive with this question, a really important question for you to consider this morning. Look at the screen and consider this question. Do do people who claim to be non-Christians in your life want to spend time with you? Ask yourself this question. Do the non-Christians want to spend time with me? Jesus was truth. He never, never, ever, ever hid what he believed. He always stood for what was right. He never caved. He was never concerned with walking away from a relationship, making sure that people felt okay. That's not what he came to do. And he says we're to follow his his way. But while he was here, people constantly, listen to this, people constantly sought Jesus. Isn't this interesting? I think Satan is so brilliant in this this regard. He, He wants to Convince us as Christ followers that it's our goal to sow seeds of unity. And we see that, that sure, Jesus wanted the church to be unified. But we, we began by looking at this passage this morning where he says, I came to be divisive. I've come to start a fire. But interestingly, people continued to seek him. Now, yes, they sought him for many a reason, some to question him, some to touch him. And yes, some to kill him. I believe this to be true. Look at the screen. Living a life of truth is attractive to both believers and haters. Believers seek me to talk to me about the Christian walk. Haters seek me to talk to me about the Christian walk. Living a life of truth is attractive to both believers and haters. Now, the two conversations may differ. But the point still stands. Look at the screen. When I live for truth, I get the attention of the world. For one reason or another. And then look at the next part of this statement. Quite difficult to digest this morning. If I'm not being sought, I'm probably not living for truth. I need another period right there, don't I? That's difficult. If I'm not being sought, I'm probably (laughs) not living for truth. Jesus was sought. By lovers and haters. Number five, the burden is on me to know orthodoxy. Let me give you two more. We'll wrap this morning. The burden is on me to know orthodoxy. If you were with us in in week two last week of this series, then you probably recall the orthodoxy passage we looked at. The first statement, I believe, in the Old Testament of true orthodoxy. In Deuteronomy chapter six, when Moses has assembled the nation of Israel together, they're on this journey towards the promised land. They are being led through the wilderness. They've come out of 400 plus years of Egyptian captivity. The Ten Commandments have been handed down to them, really as as the law to follow, to live out truth. And Moses says this to them, the chapter after the chapter where we read about the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments, Moses says, that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. 
Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. You remember this probably from last week. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. These words are not suggestions nor recommendations. Instead, Scripture makes it clear. Look at the screen. The burden is on me to know these truths. The burden is not on my pastor to teach me these truths. It's a part of my role and I love it. But whether I teach truth or not, the burden is on you to know these truths. Look at the screen. Not to condemn me, but to change me. Not to condemn, but to change. And not just for change's sake, but so that I can then be a life of orthodoxy to a world desperate to know truth. Remember this from last week? That's why this is so important. Because we are an outward-thinking, go-focused church. Less than 29% of Americans say, I rely on my faith when making a moral decision. Remember this from last week? Most Americans are just as likely to rely on other people. Just as likely to rely on other people or on their own personal beliefs and feelings and expressions when when making an important moral decision. Less than 15% of Americans ages 18 to 29 say, I turn to God's word. As a moral guide in my life, 44%, almost 50%, almost half of 19 to 29 say religion is not a part of my, of my life. And they embrace a no preference when it comes to religion. One in four American adults, that's almost 60 million by the way, have converted from religion to non-religion. We looked at that term last week, that's what is called, or rather who are called non-verts. Church, I hope this burdens you. Does it burden you? It should burden you. The other night, Amy and Stephen and Kristen and I, we, we got together and we like to talk life and church and have a good time and we pray for y'all. I want you to know your, your pastors and their wives pray for you. Uh, we also talk a lot about dogs. And we made a quick trip to Arkansas Friday to see my mama, my daddy, and my brothers. And the fishers were brave enough with already two dogs in their home to take our two dogs, God bless them. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for that one. But we, we were talking, and, I, and I, Kristen said this, and then Amy said this, and I think the both of them started crying. And then Steven started crying. And he, no, I don't think he cried, did you? No, you just started hugging. Steve's a hugger. He just started hugging me. And so we, the ladies said, you know, this, this stuff that we talked about, meaning where we went last week and these statistics that I just walked you through, uh, both Amy and Kristen said, this is so burdening, and it is burdening. That's why I put it here. And that's why I put it in a, in a sentence for you to ask you, does this burden you? I hope it burdens you. It should burden us, church. And the answer that Jesus gives us, you know this, that we will know the truth, and the truth will what? In the words of Jesus himself, we will know the truth. The truth will set us free. Let me give you this last thought. And we'll close in a little time of worship this morning. This is number six. Heresy requires. There's just no way around this. I've thought about this all week. I've let the Lord lead me in this, guys. And listen, there's just no way around this. Heresy requires the Christian to defend the truth. There's just no way around it. My hope for us as a church that as we continue to move through, through this series and we become more knowledgeable of, of orthodoxy and we recognize it and we get impassioned to want to live for it. I'll, I'll also say this. I'll, I'll, I'll couple my hope for us that we, we grow in God's word and, and orthodoxy with this. I hate conflict. Now, my wife might say otherwise, but I, I hate conflict. I don't like conflict. Some people, I think they, they enjoy it. They relish conflict. For many, 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 many years, my father-in-law and mother-in-law tell you this. We go to a restaurant and... And I, I, would, I would be shy to even ask for some salt. I just, I, I just didn't want to ask, and I, I now want my iced tea, and I want them to keep bringing iced tea. But I, for so long, I just didn't want to create any awkward moment with, with, with anyone. I mean, I'd, I'd much rather us just, you know, and I'm sure you're the same way. I'd rather us just not fight. I'd rather us just sip some iced tea and enjoy some chips and salsa and spend the day talking about fish bigger than the ones we actually caught. I just would like us just to all... All get along, but look at the screen, guys. The church should not be afraid to defend the truth of orthodoxy. You should write down this sentence because the next sentence I'm about to give you 
gives tremendous weight to this sentence. The church should not be afraid to defend the truth of orthodoxy. Look at this next sentence. We should be afraid when the church stops fighting to defend the truth of orthodoxy. That should bring us to a place of of great fear. There is no way around this. And Jesus has warned us of this. We've looked at these passages before. This is chapter 15 of the book of John. Before going to the cross, Jesus spends a significant amount of time talking to his, his followers. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 15, If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, he said. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours. They will treat you, Jesus says, this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. Look what he says in chapter 16. All this I've told you so that you will not fall away. He's saying, hey, I'm not trying to freak you. I don't want you to be scared. I'm not telling you this so you'll have fear. He says, actually, I'm telling you this so you won't fall away. Find confidence in this. He said, there's going to be a time, verse 2, chapter 16, the book of John, when they put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming, and it's already here, y'all, when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. And they will do such things because... They have not known the Father or me. I told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I have warned you. Look at the screen. Loyalty to the truth of the gospel places me at odds with the world. It just does. Now, let me, let, let me say this. My goal as a Christ follower is not to incite conflict. It's not. So we have a, con- a, a quandary, not a quandary, we have a quandary. Look at the screen. How do we reconcile this? How do, how do we digest this? How do, I, how do I reconcile this quandary? Wanting to be a defender of truth, yet wanting to be compassionate. This is really important, y'all. Don't check out yet. I know you're thinking about lunch. But this, this is the home run right here. How do we reconcile this quandary? We want people to love us. We want to get along. We don't want to be divisive. We want to yet also defend the truth. We want to be compassionate to one who potentially lives differently, loves differently, marries differently, and defines truth differently than we do as Christ followers. How how do we do this? Because, guys, you know it. The conversations can get heated really quickly. A co-worker who wants to get into a debate about same-sex marriage. A college roommate who wants to debate you as to whether or not sex outside of marriage is wrong. A family reunion that moves past, hey, How are you and the kids doing to, hey, what's wrong with abortion, legalizing marijuana, divorce, other cultural hot topics of the day? As we discussed last week, how do we as the church, rather than ignore or shift, how do we return to truth? How do we be truth? How do we stand? Think about this. How do we stand for orthodoxy when when our witness, our job, friendship, or family unity is on the line, Because after all, when we choose to stand for truth, the potential is quite high that taking such a stand very well might damage a fragile relationship. It could cost us a relationship. Well, really, <laughs> this could be a message in and of itself. I'm just kind of packing it here away at the end. But this could really be a message or even its, its, its own series. I've thought about this, this quandary all week. And I want to give you the answer. Before I give you the answer, I want to say this. I know every life situation is different and every conversation has its unique circumstances. And I also know there is no doubt about it that what I'm about to offer you isn't a quick fix and it isn't always a successful remedy. I think that's really important to note. But I've come, I want you to look at the screen. I've come to this extremely important conclusion when it comes to the quandary of what do we do, and I believe this to be true. I am best positioned to expose the lies of the world and to advocate for orthodoxy while also maintaining a relationship with those who oppose my views by giving the world what the world does not have, and that is this, Christ resurrected. 
You see, I'm of the belief the resurrection changes everything. We have to begin at the resurrection because without the resurrection, there is no orthodoxy. Without the resurrection, it doesn't matter on which side we land. Without the empty tomb and the risen Christ, really nothing else matters. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to avoid difficulties because we're not. It doesn't mean people are going to agree because we talk about Christ resurrected because they won't all agree. It won't always go our way, but we have to begin at the beginning. And the beginning is, well, exactly this. Look at the screen. Unless hearing, really important statement and a long one, and then we'll conclude. Unless hearing and believing that Jesus gave his life for me, and then defeated death through the resurrection, look at this, the world will never, never, never make sense of nor be able to fully comprehend God's plan for marriage, sexual identity, divorce, money, politics, racism, social justice, environmental issues, euthanasia, taking care of the poor, and on and on and on. Defending orthodoxy is proclaiming, I am guilty as a sinner and deserve an eternal separation from God. Jesus is both fully God and fully man, lived a sinless life while on earth. Jesus died. Jesus was resurrected. Jesus offers me a second chance through a personal relationship with him. If I believe in him and choose to give my life to him, Jesus saves me and offers me eternity with him in heaven. This is orthodoxy and anything other than this is heresy. Church, the only solution for sin, the only fix for falsehood, and the only hope for heresy is the resurrected Christ. We'll unpack that more next week. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? It's quite the quandary, I know. We begin with Jesus reminding us that he's come to set the world afire. And then we think, how do we, how do we connect that reality to the, the co-worker or the son or the spouse or the child who believes other than orthodoxy. It's a difficult place for us to find ourselves, but Scripture reminds us that Jesus gave his life for these very difficult and real and challenging conversations. And so there's power in the story of resurrection. We can't change lives. We can't unify We can't offer hope and peace and fulfillment outside of the story that Jesus gave his life and he is the answer to all of life's quandaries. Father, would you give us peace and fearlessness and confidence to stand for orthodoxy to proclaim Christ resurrected, to be a voice of truth in a world desperate to hear it. In your name, amen. Will you stand?